Growing up, I thought everyone had a second family in their basement. In retrospect, I understand how ridiculous that sounds, but it was all I'd ever known. I knew that every night, my dad tented the leftovers from dinner with foil, got up without a word, and carried the plate to the basement. I'd listen from my room as he lumbered down the creaking steps, held my breath to hear the muffled mumblings of his greeting. I knew that every morning he'd make the trip downstairs to see his second family off before work, then kiss me on the top of my head and ruffle my hair as he walked out, and I knew that each Christmas he'd bring a sack of brightly wrapped packages downstairs in a Santa suit. I knew that my dad had a second family in the basement, and it seemed so normal that I thought everyone else did too. I'll never forget the first time I asked mom about them. I was young, maybe five, when I finally found the words to ask. Mommy, why can't I play with the people in the basement? My mom was the human embodiment of frenetic energy, an organic perpetual motion machine, always pacing or cleaning or stirring a pot, always with a lit cigarette tucked between her yellowing fingers. I'll never forget that, as the question hung in the air. She finally stopped for the first time. Her stillness was unsettling in a way I can't quite explain. We don't talk about them, she rushed, chasing the hurried statement with a lengthy drag off of her cigarette. She blew a plume of smoke out the open window before leaning down to meet me at face level her bloodshot eyes mere inches from my own. You don't need to play with the kids, but the kids need daddy. She paused again, the haunting image of her at a standstill etching itself into my mind permanently. And finally she muttered, Daddy needs them too. That night, I heard my mom shrieking at my dad in their bedroom. I was surprised that they didn't know that I knew, more shocked, frightened even, to find out that they didn't want me to know. And most of all, they didn't want me to tell anyone at school. Anyone at all, really. After that night, everything was different. My dad only tented the leftovers after dinner, only brought the food downstairs after I'd gone to bed. He stopped visiting them in the mornings altogether. My mom started acting differently, too. I'd always noticed that she was distant from my dad. Had always noticed how she bristled under his touch. How she stole away to the other side of the room whenever he entered. But it got worse after that. As a kid, I felt deeply guilty. I felt like I ruined my parents' marriage. But I was just a kid, and I was curious. My mom meant to dissuade me from asking more questions, but she accidentally gave away something that made me even more curious. The downstairs family had kids, maybe kids my own age, to play with. I wanted, no, I needed to know about them, in the way that little kids need to understand all the strangeness of this chaotic world, need to make sense of the nonsense that surrounds us daily. The nonsense that we became acclimated to as adults, but struggle with endlessly as children. Like a puzzle or a riddle or a word problem on a math test about buying 80 watermelons. Another change following that critical night. The basement door was fitted with a sturdy lock. Even still, I needed to know. There's something horribly dreadful about finding out that a second basement family is abnormal. Something more horrible still about not knowing who or why. By the time I was seven, I made up my mind to get to the bottom of it. To avoid getting into trouble, I could only investigate when three conditions were met. I was home from school, my dad still at work, and my mom wasn't around to catch me. But these circumstances rarely overlapped. 
But the first time I came home from school to find that my dad's car wasn't in the garage and my mom's endless movement had driven her to the point of exhaustion, I threw off my shoes and I crept to the basement door, quiet in my sock feet. And then I knocked. It was a quiet knock for fear of waking my mom from her nap. But it was a knock nonetheless. It was more than just a knock, too. It was an initiation, an invitation, a confrontation of my life's greatest and most terrifying mystery. I jumped when a gentle knock returned from the other side. It was almost immediate, like the person on the other side had been waiting for me. The thought froze me in place for a moment, but I knew I didn't have any time to waste. My mouth felt suddenly of sandpaper and chalk, but I leaned into the door to whisper, Hi. Hi. It was a little girl, her voice sweet yet timid, like testing the keys on a piano for the first time. I am Ricky. What's your name? There was a long pause. Lila, my brother is Isaac, but he doesn't talk so good, but he's still little. Mommy says he'll start talking when he's ready. There's three of you down there? Mm-hmm, she replied simply, as if the entire situation felt as wholly normal for her as it had for me, just on the opposite side of the basement door. Daddy comes to visit sometimes, though so I guess there's four. My eyes widened as a flurry of questions began to sprout in my mind, but I heard my mom start to stir in her room. I sped down the hallway and into the playroom. I busied my hands with my toys, but my mind was somewhere else. The sprouts of questions continued to grow rapidly, soon overtaking my thoughts like an unruly batch of weeds. And like weeds... The questions were stubborn, hard to, and possible to get rid of. The roots of the situation and its implication unraveled, stretched through my whole body. Fear planted itself firmly in my belly as I was forced to confront the possibility that I didn't really know my dad, didn't really know my own family at all. If my dad was Lila's dad too, what did that mean for me? for my family. And why wasn't she allowed to come out of the basement? Over the next couple of years, I stole away to the basement door in those rare moments of freedom. I got to know Lila, got to like her and eventually even to love her. She was my best friend. As a kid, I was pretty lonely. My classmates shied away from me for reasons I couldn't quite understand like something about me was inherently repellent to my peers. I only had one friend at school. And at home, I had Lila. As we spoke more, a never-ending stream of back-and-forth questioning crammed into the briefest moments of time. We both came to understand the differences between us, between our lives and our circumstances. The differences that at first felt so normal, grew bigger and sharper and scarier than either of us could comprehend. The unfairness of it all became impossible to ignore. Lila lamented that she wasn't allowed to go to school, that she couldn't go outside to play or make friends or ride bikes around the cul-de-sac in the summer until the street lamps flickered on and the bugs started to scream. She even longed for the things I loathed most. Homework, rinsing off my dishes after dinner, tidying up my room each Sunday morning. She said she'd lived in that basement all of her life, was probably even born down there. She couldn't remember anything different before being locked up in the cold and musty room. I'm ashamed to admit this, but eventually... I couldn't manage the guilt I felt for living the life Lila never had, could never have in my mind. I was so young and so naive, I didn't know how to manage the situation anymore. So I did the only thing I could think of. I stopped trying. 
I stopped visiting Lila. No more secret whispered exchanges. No more quick knocks on the door just to let her know that I was there. That anyone was there for her. Days and weeks and months and years trickled by with Lila never quite leaving my thoughts, but with her existence instead compartmentalized, confined to the basement of my own mind. At home it was harder to keep the thoughts of her locked away. When my dad brought her dinner hours past my bedtime, I'd lay awake warm in my bed, and sometimes I'd hear her scream. Sometimes I'd hear the tray clatter to the floor, the plate fracturing on impact, and sometimes I'd hear her crying, awful, painful sobs, while I assembled new Lego sets in the playroom. And sometimes she, well, she would call out my name. I'll never forgive myself for this. In fact, I hate myself for it, and I deserve to, but I ignored her every time. Worst of all, though, was when she started knocking. I was finishing up my science homework for the day when the first knock came. A quiet knock, but a knock nonetheless. An initiation. An invitation. A confrontation. My blood ran cold as I realized where it was coming from. Who it was coming from. I hopped on my bike and I didn't come home until dinner was on the table. That night, I heard my dad scream back at Lila for the first time, yelled for her to knock it off with all the knocking. He took care of her, of her little brother and her mom, and that he could only do that if she stayed in the basement, if she stayed quiet. But she wasn't persuaded, though, and her knocking only grew more frequent and louder. I was about ten years old by then. So, I had a little more freedom. All the freedom in the world compared to Lila. I avoided my house at all costs, only returning in the evenings where I'd be greeted immediately by the knocking. And by then, it was less knocking and more ramming the total weight of her body into the door. My mother took to vacuuming the house obsessively just to cover up the noise. She wouldn't even look my dad in the eyes anymore. I imagined the bruises blooming on Lila's shoulder up and down the length of her arm. If it hurt her, well, she didn't let on. She didn't stop. And sleep became a distant memory, leaving me dazed and irritable and confused and, most of all, terrified. I began showing up at my school friend's house. Now my only friend's house, unannounced, just to escape Lila's knocking. His parents clearly didn't like me, and tensions rose between the two of us kids, escalating to a boiling point that ended in a fight. I slugged him in the gut, and he returned with the words that broke me. That broke everything. A blow far more powerful than he could have delivered with the small hands balled up into fists. My mom says you're a bastard. Your mom's a whore. I had to look up the words in my dictionary when I got home. I had to gather the courage to, once again, ask a difficult question. Mom? Am I a bastard? I had to watch my mom lose her momentum to stop. Again, I had to watch what little light she had left in her go out, and I had to sit there as she left the room, had to sit there spilling hot tears as the knocking kicked up again, each powerful thrust against the door racking my mind, a painful reminder that Lila was coming for me. But my mom came back, and she returned with an old newspaper clipping in her hands, Worn at the edges, she held it up to her chest as she finally, finally told me the truth about Lila, about Dad's second family in the basement. I was young, but I needed to know. My mom knew it too. Through choking sobs, she told me about my dad's old family, the one he had had before he met her, 
the horrible mistake they'd made, the one that gave her the best thing she'd ever had in her life, but took away three others. About how my dad's old wife was already skating on thin ice, her cries for help that went unanswered, how when she found out about what my mom and dad were doing, that what little left beneath her was shattered. About how they couldn't have known, but about the guilt she carried regardless. Like a heavy backpack, mom? Yes, sweetie, but I can never put it down. That Lila was dead, and Isaac too. That their mom had done that to him, and then did it to herself. My dad found them in the basement when he got home from work. That he'd never forgiven himself and my mom never had either. That when they reappeared back in the basement like nothing had happened, even after their bodies were taken and buried all those years ago, they couldn't think of anything to do but to give them as normal of a life as possible. And yet, I had another difficult question. But why do they have to stay in the basement? I found that out later that evening when my dad came home from work and unlocked the door. Lila came out of the shadows, and I flinched instinctively as I saw her face for the first time. Saw the gaping hole in her face where her left eye should have been. Isaac was little like Lila said, but the oozing wound to his jaw would have made it nearly impossible for him to speak if he had the chance to grow up. I was scared at first, but I put on my brave face and took Lila by the hand. I played with Lila and Isaac for the first time. I shared my toys with them. I laughed with them. I didn't meet their mom that day, but I would years later, when she and Lila and Isaac knew what became of them. She struggled to cope. She doesn't come out often, but I treat her with kindness when she does. The woman I know her as, I just couldn't imagine doing what she had done. My dad's second family still stayed inside, but they were no longer confined to the shadows of the basement after that day. They became less of my dad's second family, as we all became one larger family that laughed and played and loved together. Now I don't live in that house anymore. I'm an adult now with an enormous appreciation for all the freedom and opportunities available to me that I once took for granted. I know my family is far from normal, even horrible and horrifying in many ways that I helped to perpetuate as a kid, but it's all I've ever known. I love them, all of them. I still visit whenever I can, for birthdays and for Christmas and for summer vacations. And whenever I do visit, I take a moment to be grateful for the fact that when I knock on the front door, Lila opens it.